Shall we? I think it's a short two minutes, but... Uh... Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, my name is Peter Monica. I have the honor to chair this seminar today. I welcome you on behalf of Philip Kiele, who is the main organizer of this seminar series. And so on, of course, uh, welcome to this event uh, with this title, Decolonizing, Decolonizing Rank of the Governance? Question mark. So, uh, it's a... It's a special pleasure to introduce Marcel Zwarteveen. Uh, some of you may know that we have roots in, both of us have roots in a university that used to be called Wageningen Agricultural University, it's now called Wageningen University in the Netherlands. We are both graduates from the Irrigation uh, Department, the Irrigation and Water Engineering Department, now called the Water Resources Management Department. So you see, there's no innocence in language, it shifts all the time. Uh, so we are both uh, uh, originally situated in an engineering environment and have tried to kind of have contributed to socializing the field. To her credit, uh, uh, at least in my view, very much to her credit, Marquette has stayed within the among the engineers, so to speak. She is presently based at the IAG Delft Institute for Water, International Institute for Water Education. Uh, well, I have a scholar to sow us uh, into the humanities and the social sciences, which gives us the opportunity to uh, now uh, uh, think about that and uh, see what that means to come from that background. And I'm sure you all noticed that from this talk as well. She's interested, she's a professor of water governance in both at Delft and the University of Amsterdam. Uh, uh, she is interested, Marche is interested in water empowerment. Uh, with a specific emphasis on gender relations. She's one of the very few people who has worked on masculinity in the water sector, which, uh, while we often in development studies uh, think about gender by, we may be politically correct and say it's not only about women, but we often work about distributed and, and participating justice for women, water users, for instance. Uh, in the water sector, dominated by men, masculine in culture, it, the real, one of the big gender topics is masculinity. So I hope if you, I don't know how much of that will be visible in the talk, but it, uh, uh, if you have uh, interest in that, I'm sure my friend will also be interested to talk about that. Uh, she uh, works in several projects, uh, which I'll just hint at. Uh, one, uh, I think it's close now, the drip irrigation work. Uh, uh, and presently a project on deltas, and all of that work is about the narratives, the knowledge about that topic and how the natural and the social science uh, links to each other, uh, and a topic very close to my heart. She is presently involved in two international training networks uh, funded by the EU, very prestigious projects, though that is not necessarily something that SOAS is aware of, I can tell you. Uh, <laughs> Uh, 50 PhDs in, together in a training network. Uh, one, is, one of them is uh, on local development and activist roles of activist scholars, a kind of political ecology uh, project, and the other is just starting. So as is part of that also on water governance, the next water governance. So we are presently recruiting advertisements. Uh, uh, please look at the 
website New Wave, not the music from the 1980s, but the name of this project, uh, Next Water Governance, 15 PhD positions, the best funded PhDs in Europe, so with Latin and Central for you, then you can also look at that. Uh, uh, and one of them is at SOAS, and the other 14 are in all kinds of other institutes in Europe. Okay, that's, I think, uh, enough advertisement. Uh, you can see the very broad uh, 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 interest in the water field, so I uh, uh, have anything to discuss without further ado, my face. Thank you. Uh, the floor is yours. This format is very simple. It's about 40, 40 45 minutes talk, and then we are. I did sign my talk. I already said that, so I may, I may take more than 45 minutes, but I'll, but I'll, I'll try to to keep time. So thank you, uh, Philippe, for inviting me. And thank you, Peter, for the nice introduction. Nice to see you all here. It, it was actually very good of you, Philippe, to invite me, because I really needed to spend some time on, on, the, on this groundwater project. And so this, you forced me to, to get, st get the work started. So what I will do uh, today, I will talk about a groundwater project that I'm part of. And, and before I say some, something more about the project, perhaps it's good that, to say that um, uh, groundwater is a very important source of water and it has become increasingly so because of ever cheaper drilling and pumping technologies. Uh, there's a lot to do about the groundwater. If you, if you, I mean, just yesterday there was an announcement of a new groundwater policy initiative these abound. There are so many groundwater policy initiatives. Um, and there is um, there's something interesting about the, the policy statements on groundwater, I find, because on the one hand, they all proclaim the, the beauty of groundwater, as it were, and the importance of groundwater as a source of food, as a climate buffer, as also as a, as a a fountain of development almost so it's almost it's a call for 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 tapping into the yet untapped as yet untapped groundwater resources so that's what one one call of the policy statements uh, also this one um, but on the other hand there is a there's a lot of pessimism and alarmism about aquifers that are depleting and that are being polluted I find the two next to each other a bit contradictory. And, and it becomes even more contradictory in a way if you start reading the groundwater management and governance literature. Because if you start reading that literature, it becomes very clear that ground, the governance of groundwater, nobody knows really how to do it. Eh? There's, no, there's no clear guidelines or, or rules or regulations or ideas about, hey, how to, how to regulate how to manage, how to govern this, this resource, which is invisible. Uh, it's very difficult to know quantities of groundwater. Eh? Hydrogeology is a very difficult uh, topic. Uh, in the project, we work with hydrogeologists, and it's, uh, it's mind-blowingly difficult. Um, um, which also means that it's a resource that often people don't know how much of it there is. And so if you don't know how much of it there is, then it becomes very difficult to manage it and to share it, etc. And on top of that, of course, the, the groundwater, the accessing it happens through, through tube wells or to wells and pumps. And these are often individually owned. They're easy to hide. In, in, in some of the places I've been in Peru, the agro-export companies, they have their, their big tube wells and they don't even allow people from the government to come in and to check the tube well. So it's, it's, that's one scenario, but it's almost impossible for any government agency to, to keep track of all the wells and to keep track of how much water is being extracted or being used. So it's truly difficult to govern. And, and that puzzle is a recognized puzzle. Um, so in groundwater, and, and, and as I think as, as is shown in, the, in this, this paradoxical, on the one hand saying, hey, we have this resource, let's use it, because it, it can be a fountain of incomes, profits, uh, uh, climate buffer, whatever. And on the other hand, hey, aquifers are depleting health. This, these two uh, 
um, um, of course, what something that is that is interesting about groundwater is that you can use it now, but indeed uh, it's not clear for how long you will be able to use it. So the, there's a tension between the direct the direct benefits that, that it generates and the and the, and the longer term uh, benefits. But there is also a tension between. If, if I use groundwater and you're my neighbor, then I might suck your wells dry or I might also use yours. Eh? So there's also a tension between individuals and, between, and, and how this, this resource is shared. And these two ch tensions are at the heart, I think, of the groundwater governance challenge. Now, a little bit about the project. These are most of the project numbers. This was last year when we had our kickoff workshop in, uh, in Pune. In, in Maharashtra. I think perhaps Ayatri and, and I forgot your name, you will recognize some of them. Um, the project is, is, the idea with the project is, it comes actually out of the, of, partly out of the DRIP uh, project that Peter mentioned. While we were working on the DRIP project, we realized that in several places that we had been working, there are very interesting initiatives of communities or people or groups of women or NGOs who organize around groundwater either to, to protect the resource or to share it better or, or they organize uh, to protest against uh, extreme forms of, of uh, extraction, for instance in Chile, by lithium mines. And we thought our hypothesis was, hey, perhaps these initiatives are interesting to study because perhaps they contain insights into how groundwater governance can be done. So this was the, basically, this is basically the idea of the project. It's, is we have identified a number of those initiatives in the oasis of Algeria and Morocco, in places, some, several places in Maharashtra, in um, Peru, in California, in Tanzania, Tanzania is a slightly different case. So today I will be mo mostly speaking about Peru, a little bit about Morocco. So decolonization, I must admit, I have not, I like the term, it sounds appealing. I must admit that I have not spent a lot of time reading on decolonization. So whatever I say about decolonization, and if you know more about it, then feel free to to uh, interrupt me or to, to question me or challenge me. I have, so what I'm doing now is, is, what I wanted to do in the presentation is really thinking through, is what we do in the groundwater project, could we consider this as a form of decolonization, and if so, how? Um, so, uh, this is the, what on the slide I this is what I thought that a decolonization of groundwater governance would consist of. It's basically three things. First, hey, identifying how current approaches to doing and knowing groundwater are colonial. Are they colonial? And if so, how are they colonial? By 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 revealing or exposing these approaches as colonial, I thought perhaps you, then you create space for recognizing that these are not universal or the only possible ways of, of governing, creating space for also recognizing others, alternatives, other ways of knowing, doing groundwater. And then the, as last, the last point, then perhaps an interesting conversation can start. A new conversation about, hey, what is good groundwater governance and how to do it? So that's basically how I envisage decolonization, and I don't know whether that is the same as others would uh, do it. Uh, but before I start, I, I have two other reflections. Uh, one is comes from um, Amit Acharya, who we, whom we invited last year at IEG to give a lecture in what we call Week One. Week one is the first week when all the students come to the, to the institute. Some 250 students, they come from all over the world, but mostly from the so-called Global South. They come to Delft, to the Netherlands, in the hope of acquiring water wisdom. 
And of course, the, the, the coming to Delft is somehow associated with, implicitly or explicitly, with an idea that the best wet water wisdom or very good water wisdom is to be found in the Netherlands because of all kinds of associations of the Netherlands with water expertise. Uh, what we wanted to do in this week one, and the reason to invite Amit, was we wanted to, to use this week to question some of this, these assumptions about the superiority of Dutch water expertise. Also, the question, to question a little bit, hey, what is good water expertise and, and what, what does location, where, where does what ex, good expertise come from? Are there other sources or ways of knowing water? That was a little bit the idea. And when, it, so and it's always very energizing and inspiring to do this and to, to have these conversations with students. And Amit, he gave a wonderful lecture and that was also many, many students also were really inspired by that. But this is one of the questions that Amit asked. And he said, how are we supposed to decolonize Anglo-European knowledge, hegemony in academia, if most of such efforts are headed by Anglo-European scholars in universities in the West? Scholars from the majority world need to really think through this. And I thought it was an interesting question, and it also made me think. And I think, yes, in a way, there, it is a bit awkward. It is a bit awkward that these students who come to, the, to Delft full of hope, and full of uh, aspirations to, to gain better knowledge, on the first week we tell them how we shatter their hope a little bit, and eh? we question their hope, so that's a bit awkward. Mm -hmm. It's also a bit awkward that I, as an old white female professor, tell them, hey, the knowledge you come to get here in the Netherlands is not that good after all, or something. Mm -hmm. eh? So that's also a bit awkward. Mm -hmm. um, so yes, so I, in there I agree with, uh, with Amit, Amit's question, or, and, but when, while thinking it through, I thought, yeah, the question, on the other hand, also suggests that it is possible to have a pure or innocent position in the debate about decolonization. And that it's possible to somehow have that, as, that if you come from the majority world, as Amit calls it, that then automatically what you have to say or, or your knowledge would be more decolonial. And I think that would also be a, be a bit naive. So, but I think the awkwardness of the question and the, the awkwardness that the, the question causes is important. And I think we have to, and I at least think staying with it, this awkwardness and making it explicit and using it as a, a source of reflection about positionalities in, in knowledge is, is very important. So rather than making it quickly go away because it's awkward and, and it really gives a feeling of unsettledness, I think it's good to continuously remind, I at least want to remind myself about this, this awkwardness and where it comes from. So that was my first uh, reflection. And the second reflection has to do with uh, this article, Decolonization is not a metaphor. And um, what can I say about this? It was interesting, just when I was preparing for this seminar, I was uh, asked to review a, a thesis done by an Australian scholar who was studying groundwater in northwestern Australia. And the topic of the thesis really was, hey, how, does, how, does, how do Australian water polit policies uh, acknowledge or not indigenous waters and indigenous knowledges. That was the topic of the thesis. Um, the thesis was had used quite strong language, but by reading the thesis, what, what, what I realized is that, hey, indeed, decolonization is not a metaphor, because the thesis very clearly traced the Australian water history through two settler colonialism and to a particular way of uh, appropriating land, a very violent ways of appropriating lands and waters that have, that have occurred in Australia. And the thesis said, well, this, the, the current water policies and laws and, and institutions are still a legacy or still bear the legacy of this settler colonialism of the past. So this was one, that, and I thought, oh yeah, it's not just about decolonizing education or not just about 
thinking through how knowledge systems are still colonial and we need, or epistemically, epistemologically uh, Western or something. It's also about continued uh, forms of land and water appropriation that, that in a way still bear the legacy or have the legacy of, of these older forms of settler colonialism. And, and interestingly, I, when I was thinking about this, I was uh, corresponding with, because we, some of the one site in our groundwater project is California. So I was uh, emailing with uh, one of our Californian partners and I was asking her what, what, in what direction is your work going and she was actually the one who sent me this article. She said, well, what I want to do, I want to trace the history of California's, or California's dealings with groundwater also to this settler colonialism. And she wanted to engage with an with a, with a emerging movement of indigenous scholars who, who are doing this. Again, also saying, hey, it's still ongoing, it's not a metaphor. So for me, that was important. I thought, okay, yeah. It's important for, in two ways. It, it's also important be, to realize, hey, words matter. Eh? Words are, and concepts and theories are also world making. So it's not just about education, it's also about what happens to lands and waters. So this, this just has two first uh, reflections. Uh, these, I, I always like these pictures. Uh, Carolina Dominguez Guzman took them in Peru. There are billboards on the side of the roads, big billboards actually to promote uh, um, the arrival of agro export, agro industrial companies. And so what they say is well, this one says, algo bueno está pasando. So something good is happening. Um, I think it is interesting that you need billboards to tell this. <laughs> Uh, but it's also interesting to, to show that, hey, there is there's active efforts needed to promote this kind of plantation agro-export agriculture, and I'll say more about it later, um, and, and to convince people that this is the good, this is what we want. So uh, also to say, yes, it's more than a metaphor, this is also actually happening. So, what I will do now, I will first try and say something about, about this more than a metaphor. And, and I will say, try, and, and I, what I've tried to do is to look at how is, is it possible to look at groundwater governance as, is, or is it useful to call it colonial? And I've chosen the easiest, perhaps the easiest example. This is an example from the, the Ica Valley in Peru. It's a, a view from the sky. It's literally conquering the desert uh, by tapping into the aquifer. Yeah, so it's an aquifer. And so it's an interesting, uh, yeah, so by digging ever deeper, it becomes possible to, to cultivate ever more land. So in that sense, indeed, groundwater can be considered a new or another or a new agricultural frontier. And in, in, in that sense, it resemb resembles forms of settler colonialism. So, so when, you, when, we, you adopt, when adopting a very broad definition of colonialism, groundwater governance can indeed be said to be colonial in two main ways, according, I think at least. It's the first one is in how it goes accompanied with replacement. The replacement is a quite neutral term, but you could also say erosion, transformation, and sometimes destruction of existing forms of living and using lands and water by new ones. This, not, this often, but not always, happens because these lands and waters are appropriated by newcomers or outsiders. In colonial terms, these would be called, called settlers from elsewhere. And here in Peru, um, and that this happens in many countries, I, uh, I think of Mexico, I think also of India, uh, of uh, Morocco, uh, of Chile. What happens here, Peru has very, is very actively promoting this, kind, this type of agriculture. 
how it is it had, through privatization of land and water, land and, uh, and water, a water tightening program that was explicitly aimed at making it possible for different waters to be compared and therefore exchanged, and this exchange in a context of market capitalism means appropriated by those who can pay the most. Uh, but that was the intention. Also, free trade agreements in, in Peru with the United States, um, a, very, a very generous and welcoming investment climate, subsidies, all kinds of subsidies. So everything in every everything in Peru was the arm, uh, Peru had its arms wide open to welcome investors from outside, agro expert in comp companies. And these fields are asparagus. This is asparagus. So what is grown here is asparagus. Um, and of course, as if I the the billboards that I just showed this 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 kind of. Uh, Intensification of agriculture goes accompanied with a, with a lot of talk, discourses, but also a lot of science to say that this is good. And this is development, this is modernization, this is what, is, what should happen. And a, a, a lot of groundwater science is also, and I'll come, come back to that later, is mobilized to support this. So just a few slides to say to... Uh, to say a bit more, to show a bit more about what happens in Peru. So it's very clear what happens, right? You can see the, the, the slide here. It, it shows the area uh, cultivated with asparagus, and it links that to how much water the, this growing of asparagus uses. A slide about how the, and this is 2008. The interesting thing is, or one of the interesting things is here, I mean, we are now to 2020, and in 2008, and I remember it well, when I was in Peru, people said, well, we only have five more years to go, but the aquifer is still not empty, or it's still not fully depleted. People, uh, uh, asparagus are still being grown, which itself, I think, is telling, because, because this aquifer and the behavior of the aquifer and how much water there is is so difficult to know. Um, so what happens is, here's, here's other slides, what happens, this is asparagus, and, 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 and what happens is that this, here in the Ica Valley, what has happened is this, these agro-export companies come in, they buy land, and lots of, a lot of this land originally was very cheap because it was desert land, they needed also water, what they would do is they would they would uh, start buying the wells of existing farmers. And it's a whole, it's a complicated history, and if you're interested, I can say more of it, because there were, and there still are, many small, smallholder farmers also, and some of them also went into asparagus farming, but many of them also saw themselves more or less, or it was very attractive for them to sell their wells to these agro-export companies, also because they would offer very high prices. So what you see is a total... Um, uh, reconfiguration of uh, land, water, labor, because the labor needed for these asparagus farms often was where the indigenous people would come from the high mountains, so not the people from the area itself, because that labor was cheap. And, and in that time, indeed, water was very cheap, so attractive for agro -ex export companies, but also they wouldn't have done it if labor had been more expensive. So it's labor and water together. Mm. Um, so what is also happening is these outsiders, of course, they clearly they come because they are interested in, in, in profits. And so that is a, a sort of, you could say, a sort of colonial move because they don't have any attachment to the lands or the water. They don't have any interest, interest to invest in caring for this land or water because if there's no more water, they will, they will simply go and move elsewhere. Now, I can say more about this and I will say more about this later, but this is a little bit how many people would present this story. And you can, you can tell very similar stories about Mexico or about 
Chile, about Morocco, very similar too, although there many of the investors don't come from outside but are from Morocco itself. And, but what you can see is in all these countries, there is an active promotion by the government of an intensification of agriculture. In Morocco, this was Le Plan Maroc Vert. I think India is very active in wanting a second green revolution, which is also premised on, on making more use of groundwater. So it's, it's actively promoted and sponsored through subsidies Drip irrigation, that's an ironic one, because drip irrigation is often subsidized because it, it is thought that if you use drip irrigation, you will use water efficiently or wisely. But of course, in these cases, uh, in, in these cases, drip irrigation is mainly used to conquer the desert and not to, so yes, perhaps the per crop, uh, the, the crop per drop increases, but the overall amount of water used in uh, crop per drop uh, also increases. Um, so these, there are several ways of looking at this, and I don't know whether the, 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 the frame of, or whether calling colonial is the most helpful one. There are also other theories. There are also theories of accumulation by dispossession, or, or theories of water grabbing, that you can also mobilize to, to explain this. Now, I had put some slide here about asparagus because asparagus is also so weird. Uh, it's so weird because in Peru, and Peru is a country, especially Lima, is a country that is known for its, uh, its chefs. So you have very good restaurants and you have very good cuisine in Lima. But nobody in Peru eats asparagus. It's not a, a crop that is known. So, and the asparagus grown in Peru are the, the biggest importer of those asparagus is the UK, actually. So, uh, so there have been actions also in the UK against the import of, of Peruvian asparagus with a little bit patriotic sounding uh, slogans. Yeah. In the UK, with the homegrown ones taste is better, of course, and stuff like that, but, and, and, and not in all those actions, uh, water figured very prominently, but, but, but of course water is also figured. So with all this, oh yeah, this is, the, this is just a slide to show how groundwater can indeed be seen as an agrarian frontier. And on the, the left slide you see asparagus on the left hand, then you see closed canal, and then you see what used to be there before the asparagus came. And, and um, this is a slide of Morocco. The, on the left hand side you see the, the in, in Morocco used, the land used to be, a lot of land was in cooperatives. At some point the government um, de decided that the land used by farmers in cooperative was used unproductively or inefficiently. So it was a waste of land and also of water. They privatized it and attracted new investors. All the new in newly invested land, the newly private land that was bought by them looks like this, with the same kind of fences. With, uh, and the first thing they do is uh, hire drillers. These drillers, I don't know for some reason in Morocco, they all come from Syria. The drillers, they drill, they start drilling, and if there's water, choop, it's grapes, or it's, it's an orchard. Or that. So it's all the same. Just to see here, yes, it's also an, an, an agrarian function. All this to say, yes, it's possible. It's possible and plausible to characterize ongoing process of agricultural processes of agricultural intensification that are based on pushing the aquifer frontier. It's possible to characterize them as contemporary processes of colonialism. And doing this in a way it helps see that the resulting over abstraction and depletion of aquifers is not just collateral damage, but is intrinsic to the specific historical forms of capital farming that are thus promoted. So these do indeed resemble or the more traditional forms of colonialism 
in how they render existing forms of living and farming, of using lands and waters obsolete, both by depicting them as backward and inefficient, and by different forms of dispossession of both water and land. And the clear parallel with, with uh, colonialism is this, uh, is that tapping into deep aquifers is a form of, ex of expanding the agricultural frontier, allowing the conversion of existing habitats to agriculture, conquering the desert. So yeah, is it, that is, in that sense, calling this colonialism or a form of colonialism is perhaps useful. I think it's also useful because by, by doing this, it also becomes clear that, that problems of depletion and over-abstraction cannot just be, um, are not just problems of the individual, of the greed of individual farmers. That they're not, so it's not just the, the or the individual farmers or um, entrepreneurs, or they're also not just the, a problem of a lack of compliance or of a generic governance gap, a lack of political will, corruption, or the difficulty to enforce regulations. Yeah? Because that is, if you read the groundwater governance literature, those are the, the causes of the problems that are often given. But Indeed, the, what is happening in terms of depletion and, and pollution and, and over-abstraction is the in intrinsic feature of a form of intensive agriculture that can only make profits by systematically undervaluing water as well as labor. So I think that's important and that's useful, tracing this connection between the particular form of development and agricultural intensification and and aquifer depletion. And I think in another way, what is useful about this is to show that a lot, or, or it to show is that, that um, what happens to water, very little in terms of what happens to water is steered or guided by, by formal water policies or laws. So most of it is guided by entirely different processes, the ability to, to drill well, desire for agricultural intensification or markets or and I think that's also important because also when you read the groundwater governance literature a lot of it remains very firmly in a formal water policy law domain as if suggesting that indeed it's possible to regulate control water through permits or pricing or whatever means are proposed. So this is the more than metaphor part of the of the how what how groundwater is colonial. And oh yeah this is just to repeat eh, this is it's it's actively state promoted. It's not it's not something it's not individual entrepreneurs who are who happen to be greedy. It's it's actively state promoted its policy almost everywhere. Um, now, this, the second part is what I want to say is that, uh, about, about the colonialism of groundwater. Is I was trying to think, is groundwater science or is groundwater governance, is it possible to see a colonial legacy in how um, policy science and literature talks about groundwater governance? Now I did, I read a lot, and, and I didn't do, and yesterday, Peter and myself, we were in the workshop, and people, people kept repeating the phrase, a systematic literature review. I don't think I did a systematic literature review. I did a, a very dirty and quick one. Um, but this is what, what struck me when I, when I did, my, in my quick and dirty literature review, is, um, and I don't know, so my, the, you can also answer the question perhaps, I don't know whether you can say that, with these characteristic, characteristics, groundwater or the policy science literature in groundwater is colonial. But what struck me is it's clearly resource oriented in the, in, the, in the sense that it talks about groundwater as if it is possible to isolate groundwater both from other waters and from land and from any wider context. Um, and the main concern of all this groundwater governance literature is how to counter or avoid depletion and pollution, 
while increasing crop per drop. Uh, that, is, that is really the main concern. Um, most of the groundwater governance literature is intervention oriented and most of it uh, assumes or continues, continues to assume that there is an important role for the state in governing groundwater. So the, the means or the things that are proposed, licensing, sanctioning, often in combination with markets and private property rights, all point to the state as and, and identi identify with also with the state. What should, should the state do? Um, oh, I have two different lists here, so I should read this one. Um, yeah, what I find interesting is that, that there is a, a tendency, increasing tendency in the literature to posit water as a global problem and to say, hey, we have, yeah, I think perhaps on the waves of climate change and the Anthropocene kind of thinking, groundwater problems is a global problem. And by suggesting that it's a global problem, also the need is suggested for a, one coherent global view. And that is one, the global groundwater, the state of groundwater in the world or something, is only, is only the scientists can only um, express and articulate that. And I, I, I am always a bit, uh, dis I have a bit of discomfort with that also because it feeds into an imagination of the global as the bigger whole, to which then the local needs to, of which the local is a kind of subsystem. And then globalness then also comes to signify one overarching order or something. Okay? The one that scientists first need to unravel before policy maker makers can intervene in it. And, and this global order also then in the end feeds into a suggestion that there is one correct way of knowing and doing things, a universe or something. The, the universe that scientists can, can yeah. Um, the concern I already said is how to avoid waste, increase crop per drop, and of course the increased crop per drop efficiency. And Peter also knows this is this is what we have we have grown up with. This is the concern of the irrigation engineer. So it's it's old, and you could say perhaps it's colonial. I don't know, but it's it has not changed. It's still there. Um, of course, the the groundwater governance literature is also. This place a very strong belief in, in modernization and in tech, it has a very strong technological optimism. Also technical, technological optimism in the sense that many of the global groundwater initiatives have made big promises about uh, ever more advanced tools, models, satellites, etc. that can mobilize to know groundwater. And of course the suggestion often is that knowing is the necessary first step for governing, for managing. Uh, yeah. So this is my quick and dirty uh, review of the groundwater governance literature. Um, is this colonial? To a, in a certain sense, yes. Eh? But the, the concerns remain the same as they have always been in, in water, so perhaps that's colonial. I'm not sure how useful it is to call them like that, and perhaps another way in which groundwater governance is colonial, maybe a stronger way in which it is colonial, is that is when you when one when I looked at trying to see who are the people producing this knowledge, and if you look at that, um, it's clear that groundwater governance brings together old epistemic friends who share a long history of developing and actively promoting and circulating water knowledge, a particular body of water knowledge. And it's a body of knowledge that is very closely linked to water projects and policy reform initiatives funded by development corporation money. So it's, it's a, there's a very strong link there. So much of this knowledge is also the knowledge generation itself is also funded by development corporation money. Um, yeah, so I think in that sense there is a colonialism there, perhaps. 
Nayan. So you can say, yes, the, the groundwater governance knowledge, it belongs to a particular epistemic tradition, a particular successor project in agricultural water science, one that is directly aimed at efforts to improve the effectiveness of water projects and water policy reforms, funded and supported by development corporation money and loans. Does this matter? Let me give an example of how it perhaps matters. And the example is a bit unfortunate because this is Arjen Hoekstra. And Arjen Hoekstra, uh, not very long ago, he suddenly died. So let's also say hello to, to Arjen, wherever he is. Um, um, and what Arjen did, Arjen uh, studied in Delft and, and then he moved to Twente and he was very concerned about the state of water in the world. And what he did, he came up with this idea of the water footprint in analogy with the ecological footprint. Uh, it's a wonderful idea. Every, I think it's the 22nd of March, that the World Water Day. Every 22nd of March in the Netherlands, there is something about water in the newspapers. And, and mostly, it, often it's something like, oh, you need to have these uh, water-saving shower heads or stuff like that, or you need to sh shut off your tap when you're um, brushing your teeth, stuff like that. <laughs> Every year, Arjen would uh, send, up, send a, a letter to the newspaper saying, it's not about the saving shower heads, <laughs> it's about reduce your meat consumption. And so in that sense, the, the water footprint was, is a very powerful tool to create awareness about how much water goes into the production of whatever, whatever. Right? And to make consumers aware about, hey, you're consuming water for almost everything that you, that you use and buy. So that's the water footprint. The interesting thing is the water footprint travels also. And it traveled to Peru. It traveled to Peru uh, when uh, um, the Autoridad Nacional de Agua in Peru, the Peru Peruvian Water Authority, invited Professor Arjen Hoekstra to come to Peru to help solve its water problems. Because Peru, of course, the government knew that, hey, our our policy of, of agricultural intensification, it's draining our aquifers. Right? It's, it's sucking our aquifers dry, so we need to do something. Now, the, the Swiss and the World Wildlife Fund were happy to contribute to this effort, and they funded Arjen Hoekstra's visit to Peru. And uh, what happened after Arjen had done his visit and made recommendations, the water National Water Authority came up with this. And what is it? It's a Certificado Azul. It's the blue certificate. And it's a certificate that farmers can obtain when they promise to use water wisely in their farms. And so if they use water wisely, they get the Certificado Azul. And then, and then the Certificado Azul then also makes them eligible for subsidies. And they have, they, so it's like a, you get a, a a stamp on your forehead, you're a good farmer. That was the idea. You're in 40 minutes. Okay, okay. Um, which farmer do you think gets the Certificado Azul? Mm. This is the, the, these are mangoes, by the way. We have moved from, mango, from asparagus to mangoes. But it's also grown in the same desert coast of, of, of Peru. Which one do you think gets the Certificado Azul? The top one? Yes, the top one. <laughs> the top one. What do you think? It's done systematically like every industrial process. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it looks like a plantation, right? Yeah. yeah, it looks like a plantation. Yeah. Yeah. You're right. So, uh, so uh, the thing is, and I won't get into all the details here, but actually it's very difficult. It's very difficult to establish, to establish, to empirically establish who is using water wisely. And the only way to establish this is indeed in farms like that, in the plantation kind of farms, because you have only one crop, but there are Negroes. And the other thing is, this, these trees are irrigated with drip irrigation systems. So at some point, you can measure the amount of water because it's, it goes through tubes. You can measure how, how much you use. So that also makes and this one, 
uses the user system called POSAX. It's interesting if I show this, uh, this slide in IT to irrigation engineers. They are shocked. They say, waste, waste of water. You cannot see this. Uh, you cannot see this. The water like this in the fields. It's, it's immediately all their alarm bells start ringing. Um, and this is a, a brother and sister who, the interesting thing is they also produce mangoes for the market. So the, the, the mango that you buy in your supermarket might either come from this farm or from this farm. You wouldn't see the difference, of course, because they have all been, it's, it's been made sure that they are good enough to be in the supermarket, but they might be produced in very different ways. Which one is the more efficient? That's the, the, the point of the story. In terms of water, is not so easy to establish. Why? Because this brother and sister, yes, they have mangoes, but they also produce all kinds of other stuff with the same water. The POSAN system that they use, they have done, they have farmed in this desert area of Peru for generations. They know that they need to deal with water wisely. So they have developed this, this POSAN system, which is also a, a rainwater harvesting system. It's an aquifer recharge system. So it's, a, it's all different things. Um, if you talk to them, it's interesting. There's many interesting things about this, but there's, it's also interesting that they they do not want to have these smaller trees in neat rows. Uh, they talk about the mango trees as almost as living beings. They like the trees to be tall. But the interesting thing, of course, about tall trees and about trees that you don't irrigate all that much. They also develop much bigger roots. If you have developed big, bigger roots, you can grab more nutrients from the soil, so you need to add less uh, uh, artificial, etc. So there's a whole story to be told about this, about this comparison. Um, and why I'm telling this is, hey, if, if this water footprint travels to Peru, if this becomes the, the, the norm for do, using the water wisely, then automatically these two people they will, they, they will be seen and they become backward, inefficient, the one who are not deserving of support and the one who needs, ones who need to disappear. Whereas, of course, it could well be, I don't know, but it could well be that there is wisdom in how they use water as well. And interestingly, this research is done by Carolina, Carolina in Tucumán is Guzman. Interestingly, we are now doing some further research. Interestingly, it seems that now the government of Peru has discovered this POSA as a possible technology for saving water. So we are also tracing that. So interesting things are happening. What, is a, what I want to say, so yes, there is colonialism here as well, in a way, a colonial knowledge that may work not just to, um, uh, to expropriate lands and water, but all, also to make very interesting and, and potentially uh, good water wisdom disappear. Um, the, the pity also is that there's never a conversation between these two logics. Because engineers and agronomists, when they see this, they are appalled. And they, it's not that they're, they're, it sparks their curiosity. So there, I think, is an inter interesting idea for decolonization, is finding ways of having this conversation. And so to end my, my talk, um, oh yeah, this is just a little bit more about the, uh, my talk. I had, I think, three, three proposals for how to do decolonization. And I think the first one was, is just to redefine what is groundwater governance. I was a bit shocked to see how, how ideas about groundwater governance Although, they, although many definitions of governance would say, hey, governance is governance beyond the state. If you look at groundwater literature, it's very much still the state. It's very much focusing as if it's possible to isolate and separate water from land and from labor, etc. So I would say, hey, a, a different definition of governance is needed. Um, a contrast and compare, I think, is interesting. There's interesting work happening, especially in Australia, I, I'm discovering. And this comes from an, a small little article of someone who compared the OECD principles of water governance 
with the logics of a particular group of, of uh, Aboriginal, um, an Aboriginal community. And so I'm, I'm just copying here the, the, the logic of dealing with land and water of this, this community. And she, in the article, she compares the two, and I think doing this is very interesting. It's interesting because it brings into relief the logics of both. And then you can, have, then you can start a conversation. There's also a danger with this contrast and compare, especially perhaps if you, if you frame it in a colonial decolonial, is that, out, if that, that, is that instead of a conversation between the two, what happens is that the indigenous knowledge suddenly becomes the, the ideal or the, yeah, so that, that's, the coin is simply flipped. Um, in, instead of having the conversation and, and as, if I go back to the, to uh, this one, the, here I would very much like to invite an irrigation engineer or, and, and to, to do a good water efficiency analysis of this one and to have the conversation rather than, so not just saying, hey, this is a good one or this is a bad one, well, let's, let's study it and let's, use this, let's have some symmetry in the, in the conversation. Um, the pluralize is a third form of decolonization. And here I'm guided by three thoughts, basically, is that processes of colonization are never complete. And I'm saying this also because, yes, it's very easy for me to show these, these for me at least, shocking pictures of the desert of Peru and asparagus and to blame big, bad agro export companies. Eh, the, the, the evil is, is easy to identify. In Morocco, this already becomes much more difficult because Moroccan investors are from Morocco themselves. Some of them are, are hobby farmers and and what you also see is that some of the younger farmers in Morocco, they, they themselves want to engage in these new forms of farming. So then the boundaries start blurring. It's not so clear anymore what is the good and what is the bad. And I think a lot of, of this is, is, is true in many places. It's, uh, it is also that colonization is never complete. Realities, it's also that realities always exceed abst abst abstractions. So what if you call it... Um, um, whatever you call it, whatever theory you use, the, the reality is always more. And groundwater escape regulation. So I think what I learned from SDS scholars, so it's always interesting to find places, initiatives, things that escape uh, um, frames of or your theories. Because if you start, they, those are interesting to think with, because they can purify, they can provide new inspirations for thinking, new imagination. So learn from monsters querying. Uh, yeah. So this, uh, this is basically my presentation. And my conclusion is, yes, uh, it's, it's interesting to, to decolonize groundwater governance. I'm not always sure whether the, a decolonial de lens is the most useful one for understanding what is happening. Um, I'm also a bit scared when I read some of the decolonizing literature that it's what I already said, that it, it, it looks for a purity in indigenous people, a purity or innocence or a goodness. And I, I agree that there might be interesting things there, but there's an, it's never innocent and it's never pure, I would say. Um, so I think that a third step is the engagement with real um, um, initiatives to do water differently, to document, compare, and discuss these. And um, yeah. Thank you, my friend. It was an uh, excellent and wide-ranging talk where uh, I'm sure there are many, many uh, uh, things to respond to. It speaks to sell us in uh, different ways, the, 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 the thematic of decolonization, obviously, and uh, uh, we, we have a task force for that at sell us, and one of the elements is that uh, there is decolonizing knowledge. 
uh, and our teaching and our research. So that maybe there's reflection on that, and then there is this, the subject matter itself of uh, of groundwater and agriculture and production and the thinking around that. Um, the interdisciplinary, implicit interdisciplinarity that you are strongly advocating without uh, uh, mentioning the name, uh, which social scientists would go measure of water, uh, crop water efficiency, uh, uh, not too many. So that's, there's an interesting point there. And then the framing of governance, uh, the conceptualization of governance. Uh, 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 Philip and I teach a course on water governance, so we should take this to heart as well, I guess. <laughs> and how are we are we thinking, conceiving of uh, governments? Yeah. Is it state? I thought the statist argument was very interesting. But I'm sure there are many other dimensions also that I, uh, are closer to your interest. Uh, so I simply open the floor for questions. Let's begin with sounding out a number of the issues and not yet to collect a number of uh, questions from you or remarks or comments or puzzles. Uh, uh, and then we'll give my take just to see what the interest in the room is. Uh, I've got a question. Yeah, and please introduce briefly, just say your name and uh, uh, introduce yourself a little bit so that we know. Uh, oh, uh, okay, I don't spell yet, so I... <laughs> <laughs> um, my name's Tara, I uh, do uh, international development and humanitarian work. I am mostly in WASH, so not specifically like uh, agronomy and stuff, but I've been involved in projects that I'm kind of more based in London now, I used to be a lot more abroad. But I'm just kind of interested in what you said about the, I mean, a, a number of things, thank you very much, it was really interesting. But the the idea that like major development actors that uh, are engaging in aid, like FAO and you know, UNDP, for example, like there's lots of them, um, I found when I've had grants from agencies like that, that uh, they do fully acknowledge stuff to do with depletion. I don't think that the way that they acknowledge it is adequate in the slightest. But I don't think that there's like a, personally I haven't seen them deny the fact that there's uh, environmental depletion or, or groundwater depletion from some of the activities that take place. It's the problem is, is that the implementing partners, and I've been one of those, it's just a tick box exercise that you have to go through to sort of to demonstrate whether or not you're considering some of these aspects. And it, much like your, uh, your blue stamp, yeah. uh, it's very similar, basically, and it's, it's bullshit, to be honest. Yeah. Right, so. <laughs> but, um, but and I don't know, like, it's very difficult to know exactly how to tackle that because, to my mind, uh, a lot of the, you know, results that they want to see, they want to see them achieved at their absolute maximum within a um, presidential period or whatever, because that's where the money's coming from, like USA or something. So, like, if you're talking about five years and they've got to get those mango trees going, you can't, you can't do the bottom picture of the mangoes. You know, that that's the problem. Is is that I think that the um, the time scale needs to be more like geological <laughs> and less. Uh, less uh, you know, presidential, and that's a really simplistic way of looking at it, but like, if you actually really want to have um, you know, indicators, I was just going to ask if you have any ideas about other indicators you could use in a smaller time scale, because I know that the, your, your man, the guy who did the, water, the amount of water for a hamburger or whatever, I'm sorry, I forgot his name, but um, are there not any like, proxy indicators that you guys have come up with to sort of have ideas that could be used to assess water use? Because, you know, I've dealt also with boreholes and things like that, and you know, we just end up having to do actual tests and stuff like that, and they're rubbish as well, and they don't really mean anything, unless everybody else in the entire area switches off their pumps at the same time, if possible, you know? So I don't know, I mean, I'd be really interested to know if you have any ideas, I'm sure that people have got ideas about that kind of thing. That's a... That was a bit long, You can, sorry, you can think <laughs> about it a little bit while someone else, others also raise a few things. Yeah, yeah, thank you for that. That's a very clear point. Any other... Can you say who you are? Oh yeah, sorry. <laughs> My name is Nadine. I'm well, not exactly in this field, although I well, I I work with sort of like a heritage museums agency that we're doing projects on sustainability at the moment. So I just find it interesting personally. But um, I was wondering, uh, do you see the role of institutions such as yours? Uh, do you see that playing a role in putting pressure on? For example, new researchers, engineers, to engage in these practices of, um, you know, going on these projects, trying to learn about 
different methods of groundwater groundwater management. Is, do you see that as your type of role? These types of organizations, or which kind of um, player do you see starting that process of putting pressure on people to take part in that <laughs> process? Yeah. Uh, third one, and then we'll, uh, like I will get the floor again. One, one wishing to come on governance or, yeah, that's you, you. <laughs> um, my name is Ingrid. I used to study at Salas, and now I work as a water engineer. And I, I missed the beginning, which I'm sorry about because this is really interesting. But um, I remember you mentioning the fact that uh, sort of groundwater is being viewed at a global scale, which is damaging in a way because it becomes this sort of mm, too abstract phenomenon in a way, but um, what scale do you think is beneficial to view groundwater at? Because I mean, you've got the sort of local and then perhaps regional but or the national, but uh, water, both like catchment areas and also aquifers and stuff doesn't necessarily follow those boundaries. So like how to assess it or approach it in the most sort of beneficial and fair way. Does that make sense? You're asking for a solution. <laughs> <laughs> the floor is yours. Uh. Yeah. Um, first, uh, your question about uh, proxy indicators. Okay, I don't give you the question. Then, um, some of, of my colleagues uh, have yeah. looked at how water figures in all kinds of Certificates of sustainability standards and stuff like that. And, and, what, and yes, it's very difficult. So, what the proxy indicator that is used in agriculture is actually the presence of drip irrigation treatment in the final year. So, yeah, I can, I can say a lot about that, but, but it's very clear that that is not a good indicator for whether or not water is used wisely. But, yeah, that is. And that is as best as the, so if you, I don't know whether you've ever seen water wire schemes and stuff like that, but so there, there, are, there are some some of those products that are very pioneer because I'm producing water wire waste, and this is kind of uh, the indicator that there's a presence of drip irrigation. It's, it's sad in a way. Yeah. I mean, it's part of the work that you do to try to change those kinds of paradigms about the, the measure of what you, because it, it is a, a very holistic I think there's multiple aspects that go into it, isn't it? About what would make you use more water or less water and over what time period? It's an interesting world. Uh, the, the, one of the biggest drip irrigation companies in the world is Nikatin. It's an Israeli company. And I think uh, some four or five years back, they won the, the Stockholm Water Prize, the first ever water prize for companies because of the good work they're doing. Saving water. Also, a couple of years back, they, uh, I never know how to explain it because I'm not very good in, in this financial stuff. They, they used to be a kibbutz, kibbutz kind of company, so rather idealistic, and then they went to the stock market. Um, and so, um, um, I need to tell this story well, and I find it very difficult. Um, so now you can buy. You can buy Metafit shares in the company, and, and by the shares, they, 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 they are worth, worth something or you know, amount of money in the market. Now, it so happens that there is a, um, I don't know what that kind of company is called, it's called Termira, but it so happens that my pension fund is investing in Termira, and Termira is the fund that is, is hoping to make profit from the make up in shares. So you see, it's very complicated. That's one way in which this is complicated. Uh, the other way in which it is complicated, with, with make up in going to the market in this way, what happened in Peru is that the, the people working for the company make up in, they suddenly were, were asked to double their sales. And how could can they double? Because if they would not reach their sales targets, they would be fired. How can they reach higher targets is by over-designing the drip systems that they sell because they used to do uh, 
than more people. If you over-design, of course, it's that. So, I'm just telling you, yes, yes, we can, yes, I can say something to, uh, uh, I, I can give some advice and I write articles about it and I, I have, uh, we have organized a session at the Stockholm Water Forum to, to talk about this, inviting also people from Make a Team, etc. But how much will it change? I'm not too optimistic about it because there's a lot of vested interest. Oh yeah, your question. Um, how do who are the agents of change? Who are the agents of change? Yes. Yeah. Um, I don't know yet. I don't know yet. So yes, we had the small scale uh, um, for instance in my institute. What I do is there's some very nice hydrogeologists, and we we collaborate. We collaborate, we work together, we invite, we have discussions. They try to explain to me things about hydrogeological modeling, which I find very complicated. <laughs> I try to explain to them how we look at, at, uh, at groundwater governance, which that they find very complicated. But at least there is some, yeah, I think it's important to have this conversation. Um, I wish that it, the same thing is of What I really believe in is that one of the NGOs that we work with in, uh, in Maharashtra, and uh, I forgot the name, you also know them, it's Aquadam, so we work with them. They are hydrogeologists, but they work with, they have decided not to work for the government or for a private company, they have started an NGO. Mm -hmm. What they do is they engage with communities and help in, in, in attempts to help these communities know their groundwater sources and then engage in all kinds of, of activities to protect or recharge these groundwater ground sources. And they have some successes and some failures, but the, the intention is very good and I think, oh yeah, I think real change has to happen at that level. Mm. Uh, I, uh, but of course that's also, I don't know, so th those are, you need many of them. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Do you see that, sorry, if there's like a follow-up question from another yeah. side. Do you see that if there's, for example, a success case with one of these, that maybe that would then lead to the whole chain of discussions about the policy changing and the greater things? Is like, what is the thing that would really incentivize those types of changes? I think as long as as uh, as groundwater is still seen as a source of profit mm -hmm. and a source of development. And if, if, if not, if there's not a, a rethinking of, hey, what, what about this development really mean, or, mm -hmm. or do we really need all that much profit? Then incentives to continue depleting or over abstracting, mm -hmm. it's always more attractive to do that. Yeah. yeah. I'm a bit pessimistic. Mm -hmm. And just to add to, for a reference, if you're interested, we have a paper, recent paper on alternatives on groundwater issues where the point is made that it's not just the capitalist farms, but groundwater extraction and the visibility, the materiality of that in a village also kind of defines the aspirations of, of poor people. Yeah. So it is also from, even if you're not a groundwater user, it can represent very strongly the economic and cultural aspiration and because it's one of the very few ways out of the dire poverty uh, that people live in and then to help with long-term sustainability uh, if you can get access to water then you will use it and then uh, yeah, yeah. it's interesting that some some of the initiatives that we're studying the ground of projects are around the oasis of morocco and algeria and what i find interesting there at least in some of them not in all of them there's also this conquering of the desert, so there is around the oasis more and more land is being cultivated, also with, with groundwater, but the oasis always used to have quite specific and strong institutions for sharing groundwater, and not just groundwater, but also sharing labor and sharing the, the, the income from produce, and it seems that in some of them, these institutions adapt to these new uh, uh, forms of agriculture, and so the, the course of sharing and caring 
also put effort for the main, but that those will be interesting to, to know more about, and that's precisely what we're doing. Mm. And yes, what Peter is saying is, is, is true. In, in Morocco, young farmers, they look to these, these slightly bigger farmers, and they find it so interesting. Mm. And they think, hey, now it becomes possible for them to and be a farmer and to be cool and modern, eh? because that is the so what they, they so they really dream of of they see themselves in the future operating uh, with the reducing system from their mobile phone, not having to get their people, etc. Eh? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Now that technological dream is very good. Yeah. Have you is your question being addressed? Oh, yeah, your no, yeah. No. The, what was your question again? The, the solution. <laughs> yeah, you see, that, that's precisely the question that we try to answer in this project. I don't have a, a ready-made answer. I think there might be wisdoms in those, in some of the initiatives that we have identified, and I also think many of the initiatives never make it to the scholarly leadership. Also, also because they defy all these, all the existing conceptual schemes that there are about them. Uh, accountable to government. I, I, don't, I should not say all. There are some notable exceptions. I think Tushar Shah, who is an important example of a scholar in, in India, has done some very interesting work. Um, and, and also documenting some interesting initiatives. There's, there's others, but yeah. We have a few minutes left for a second round of short and sweet questions. Sharp um, and sweet. Can also. Okay, so I've got two specific questions. <laughs> <laughs> Um, so the first one is, you mentioned the fact that in Peru you were growing asparagus and that they were using obviously a lot of ground water. And in 2008 you said that in five years it would be gone. How, why is it so hard to assess when we're going to run out of ground water? Especially with the technology that's available today, we kind of assume that. Mm -hmm. It's quite it's 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 also yeah. difficult because, because a ground water is not yeah, yeah, from no, all the other so sources of water. No, no, we have not. So there is, this, so this, it's a very complicated story yeah. because this is a valley, and uh, some twenty, if I'm not mistaken, twenty or maybe longer back, Peru made big investments in public infrastructure mm -hmm. to transfer water from the oh, Andean okay. mountains to this valley through yes. an interesting canal system. So that much water is also still there. In some of the valleys, and so that interacts with the ground. Yeah. Water. And and then so that that is one aspect why why this is difficult. But then ask a hydrologist. Yeah. Uh, it, it's it's difficult. It's simply difficult to because you need you need you need to understand the geology, so all the the soil rock formations, mm -hmm. to and then you need to know hey where's the water and yeah. Apparently this is very difficult. This is difficult stuff. <laughs> um, yeah? Okay. Unless someone else raises his or her hand, then we have the floor is ready. I only have a general question. Where, where can we get more information about your project? Because it seems like it's it's ongoing. Yeah. So, uh, yet, not a lot of information yet. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I'm afraid. Yeah. Uh, no, we, we tell have... us the acronym so that you, we. T2GS. And we have a, a vacancy for a postdoc. So two vacancies, two postdocs, mm -hmm. one in Lancaster and one in Amsterdam. <laughs> oh, Francis, it just yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> It's already been circulated in several so like, <laughs> 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 yeah. yeah. uh, What more questions from Yeah. Um, oh, I forgot to say, say your name uh, okay. to you as well. Sorry. Uh, Hi, I'm Gayatri, I'm doing my PhD in groundwater, groundwater law. So my question, I don't know whether it will be a question or an observation, do you think this type of uh, water color analysis, conversation, is usually happening in water stress country, water stress country, and usually which is developing? So when they give more prioritizing, or when they prioritize more development, it will lead to water colonization, right? Because more MNCs are coming and investing. So, what's the take away? Why water stress countries are more colonized? Because the traditional notion of water colonization is actually to grab the natural resources with uh, more thing. But for in these type of colonization, it is with water, where there is water stress. Yeah. 
yeah. rather than the traditional notion. And another query was like, how would you define, when you say redefine or theorizing groundwater yeah. governance, do you have any suggestions like how could it be? Because if you are taking only the, um, the role of community management, uh, I think we can't deny the role of the state in the governance mm -hmm. in Tokyo. Because, mm -hmm. right? So mm -hmm. do you have any suggestions on how we could redefine the groundwater governance mm -hmm. to bring decolonization? Why does this colonization happen in water stress countries? Yeah, usually the literature yeah, shows yeah, about water yeah, stress countries. Yeah, yeah. The know. American West is an example. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. 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 I, I know for the, for the desert coast of Peru, it's just a very attractive place to grow fruits and vegetables. Because in India, the incident of flood humanite happened in a water stress state, yeah. water stress place yeah. in Palakkad, when they can actually grab the water resources in more water rich, water -rich places, yeah, yeah. but they prefer water less kind of places. Yeah. So yeah. Just yeah. My hypothesis would be that in water stress place, the, first, the primary source to be grabbed is land. Yeah. Yeah. And where do you find land available? Yeah. Where there is Water is not physically available or not economically and practically available. So uh, this is what the British did in Punjab. A relative, of course it was not an empty area, but it was a relatively empty area. And that's where they constructed the, col the, col the canal colonies, literally called yeah. canal colonies. Uh, and that's how the, Amer the Imperial Valley got colonized. Of course it was also not fully empty. But it was relative, so I think it, it, it must be the because water enough, uh, water as such. If you grab water in the northeast of India with all this rainfall, how do you get it to the places where you can actually use the land? So uh, I think people would be looking for places where there's land availability. And with, there's a plan. Yeah. Nice big stretches. <laughs> no pests yeah, in the beginning. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The second question, the government's the question. Government question. The yeah, the re-theorizing, I think, for me, it's not so much not looking at the state or only looking at the community. The re-theorizing is really about trying to find ways of understanding how governance is actually done, mm -hmm. rather than so much emphasis on how governance should be done. And I think a lot of the water governance literature is about how it should be done. Mm -hmm. Guidelines, principles. Mm -hmm. Without, and and of, especially in water, the, the gap between how things, how, how water should be managed or how water flow, should flow and how it actually flows is huge. Uh, we know this because water is capricious. Uh, it, so that makes it even more important to, to study how governance is actually done. Uh, that's, that would be my, my first suggestion. Okay, thank you we, uh, very much. We, uh, I'm sorry that we have to stop here. Uh, it is already 8.30, which says even for Solas this is a late seminar. Uh, uh, we are not yet a 24-hour intellectual economy, but I'm sure at some point we will do that uh, against our will. Uh, so thank you very much, Mark Veit. Give you a hand yeah. and congratulations. Uh, uh, not only to report, uh, but to be your birthday. Well, uh, we, uh, we don't very often get people to do two talks on that. Thank you very much for coming and for uh, asking such interesting questions. And uh, 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 hopefully, come again. Philip can say, but is there another uh, confidence in this series? Yes, but it's going to be on Friday. The